the um, the front image with the monument and the city on top of it. It's really cool. Is that your image? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah nice. Greetings and welcome to all the panelists and live viewers this evening. Michoka Heiwash Day. My name is Erin Genia and I'm Dakota. I'm a member of the Sisseton Wapatun Oyate. I currently reside on the traditional homelands of the Massachusetts people. I'm an artist in resident for the city of Boston, working within the Department of Emergency Management. My work centers Dakota philosophies and amplifies the powerful presence of indigeneity on these occupied lands. I wanna begin with a few words of my own on why we're here tonight. The foundations of the settler colonial United States of America are faulty. The pandemic we are experiencing has exposed the underlying value of white supremacy seeping into every aspect of our political, economic, health, and social systems. For indigenous people, people of color, and those on the margins of society who have survived these systems, while many have not, this realization is nothing new. We always knew it was faulty. We have been raising the alarm for over 400 years since the settlers first came to these shores. And we've been treated with violence for speaking out, for opposing it, and for simply living our lives. The white cultural supremacy bound up in Western colonization here and around the globe has, treated, has created dangerously imbalanced societies that use the threat of physical, economic, political, military harm to maintain power. It's so pervasive that it's nearly invisible to those living under it, especially those who benefit from it. As a Dakota person, I experience it as a manipulation that sets itself as the standard, forces us to assimilate and constantly perpetuates itself to reinforce structures and institutions that for me at the end of the day maintain a limited picture of reality. My truth is that other realities are possible. We don't have to continue on the path that colonial systems have set us on. With respect to the exponential climate change we're experiencing, these systems appear to be leading us as they have for so many other residents of this planet towards extinction. White supremacy and the cultural supremacy it brings is what is leading us down this path. So many monuments, memorials, and even public art are manifestations of these faulty foundations. They openly celebrate colonization and the myths of white cultural supremacy. But why should we keep celebrating slavery, ethnic cleansing, land theft, genocide? The truth is that today's settler descendants continue to benefit from these crimes against humanity. Not only that, but colonial systems of the past have morphed into today's systems of mass incarceration, environmental exploitation, police violence, mass shootings, deportations, race and gender-based killings, and the list goes on and on. Are these things we should be proud of? These truths must be grappled with honestly and not mythologized, not hidden, not whitewashed. In March of this year, in response to the stark racial and economic disparities laid bare by this pandemic, the mayor of Boston has rightly declared racism to be a public health emergency. If we are truly committed to this task, 
We need to remove those monuments that create an environment of hostility toward the people at whose expense this country was built. It's a simple but profound act and acknowledgement. The harder work will be addressing the values of white supremacy that drive our systems and our own actions. In tonight's panel, we'll examine how colonial myths perpetuated in Boston's public space contribute to this public health emergency of racism. Building off the words of last week's speakers, we'll continue to raise these issues for the public and those decision makers who could make a real difference towards rejecting white supremacy and colonial mythology in our city's public spaces in monuments like the Christopher Columbus statue, the Founders Memorial, and many more. So at this point, I would like to turn to our speakers and also want to say thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, we will be hearing from Elizabeth Solomon, who is a member of the Massachusetts Tribe of Ponkapog. She has spent over 30 years working in public health in both academic and community-based settings. She's currently the Director of Administration in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. We'll be joined as well by Dr. Darlene Flores, mother of three, who comes from a lineage of curanderos, healers from Borican, Puerto Rico. She's the sole owner of Caraya Wellness Clinic and a tribal member of Higuayagua Taino of the Caribbean. Heather Lavelle is a second generation Italian American and co-founder of Italian Americans for Indigenous Peoples Day, a Massachusetts based group supporting indigenous led efforts to rename Columbus Day across the state. Lavelle is also a museum director and curator in the Boston area. We'll also be hearing from Pierre Belanger, Ghazal Jafari, and Pablo Escudero of Open Systems, a design-based nonprofit research organization of builders, educators, and farmers dedicated to opening systemic knowledge related to complex socio-ecological challenges and geopolitical conflicts at the intersection of land, water, environmental justice, spatial inequality, climate change, and community self-determination. To each of our speakers, I would like to ask that you share your preferred gender pronouns as well as the name of the tribal people upon whose land uh, you are on for our viewers and listeners. And for our viewers and listeners, um, if you have questions, you may please leave them in the comments and we can answer them after the live stream. Also, um, captions are available by clicking the captioning button in the video or in the comments. So now I'd like to turn to Elizabeth. Um, please just briefly tell us about yourself, where you're from, and share a little bit about what you do. Helps if I unmute myself. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Elizabeth Solomon. I'm a member of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. Um, I am originally from Brockton, Massachusetts, which is um, actually within the territory of um, my ancestors, and so um, have lived here. Um, my family has lived here um, for, or my, dis or my ancestors have lived here for thousands of years. Um, as Aaron said, um, I work, have worked in public health for over 30 years, both in terms of research, um, community-based work, and now in actually public health administration. Um, but that's sort of my paid job. More, I'm more, my passion is really um, talking about indigenous issues here in the local area, um, looking um, at social justice issues and working to bring those ideas to the fore and um, helping to make some change. And I wanna thank Erin for um, organizing this and thank everybody for being here and listening.
Darlene, uh, would you be willing to um, say a few words about yourself and tell us a little bit about the work you do and where you come from? And thank you so much, Elizabeth, um, for your introduction. So no, no, everybody. Good evening. I am Dr. Darlene Flores. I am a Taino descendant. I'm actually right now located in Brookline, which is the tribal homelands of the Massachusetts uh, Ponkapog people and um, born raised here in Massachusetts. I belong to the Higuayagua Caribeño Taino tribe. I'm actually uh, a doctor of chiropractic. Um, in the native terms, I'm a bone setter. Uh, so I do mix some of my traditional chiropractic work with a lot of my indigenous spirituality. Um, yeah, I do a lot of work in my community with the children and educating them on the culture of who the Taino people are, um, a lot of people here, being born and raised here in Massachusetts, they don't really know who the Taino people are. Um, the Taino people are basically the Arawak natives, indigenous people from South America that migrated to the Caribbean islands, which is present day Cuba, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, Puerto Rico. Bahamas, Northern Lesson Antilles, some even islands off of the tip of Florida, the Bimini Islands. So the Taino people were the first people that found Christopher Columbus lost at sea. So we all learned the, the story of Christopher Columbus landing here in the USA. He never landed in the USA. He landed in the Caribbean Islands and he was, um, lost at sea and we found him and we were generous enough to welcome him with open arms and the rest is a uh, history but being that i was born and raised here in massachusetts i never ever heard the true history of who christopher columbus was um, i only heard the romanticized version in the history books and that i really really did not get to know who indeed chris columbus came across until I was in college, me being a descendant of Taino people. So with my own children and with the children of our tribe and people who are not part of our tribe, you know, Massachusetts is full of Cubans, Dominicans, Haitians, Jamaicans, you know. You know I'm here to educate and culturally accept them and, and let them know, um, you know, that, that they are indigenous. And uh, we are still here, we are not extinct. So this, every Christopher Columbus Day here in Massachusetts, the Taino people are very active, but since the pandemic and everything else that's been happening, and then of course the beheading of the Christopher Columbus statue, um, it has brought out, you know, who indeed Christopher Columbus is, the atrocities that he's done, um, what he, who he really is, and it, it, brought out a lot of uh, negative feelings to see so many people that still wanted to keep the Christopher Columbus statue up after learning or starting to educate them and, you know, teach them who this man really was and how it affected not only, you know, myself, but it affects our children and affects everyone from the Caribbean. Massachusetts is, is we have a lot, a lot of different nationalities here. So it's just interesting to see what exactly is going to happen with the whole Christopher Columbus and um, not only the Christopher Columbus but you know all the other statues and I'm not here to erase uh, cancel culture but let's teach what the real history is and teach who these people are and you know how it affects our children and you know everybody else who are black indigenous people of color thank you thanks so much Ben. Heather, would you also um, introduce yourself, say a few things about your work and where you're from? Yes, uh, Heather Lavelle, and I'm a co-founder of Italian Americans for Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, pronouns are she, her, and hers. 
I'm a second generation white Italian American on my mother's side and a fifth generation Irish American on my father's side. And I live and work in the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe. Um, and tonight I'm actually speaking from Bar Harbor, which is the land of the Passamaquoddy. And my, under, my way of understanding myself and my place in the world has always been to learn about who has come before me. And in that process, I have learned about the first people of this land and the true history of this country's founding. And I've learned that the conquest of these lands started with Columbus and he and other conquistadors basically wrote the playbook for the genocide and subjugation and forced assimilation of native peoples of North America. And that all of this took place within a structure of white supremacy and how within that structure, the erasure of native peoples continues today. But I've also learned about my own past and like 90% of Italian Americans in this country, my roots are also from impoverished Southern Italy. Calabria, Campania, and Abruzzo, and both sides of my family came here to escape oppression. They emigrated from South Buffalo, where I uh, to South Buffalo, where I was born, which is the land of the Seneca Nation um, of the Haudenosaunee. Um, and when they arrived here, not only did they come to escape oppression, but when they arrived here, they faced tremendous discrimination, both eth ethnic discrimination and religious discrimination. So understanding this painful history, I find it completely unacceptable that many Italian Americans can feel that it's okay to inflict the same sort of trauma on, an, on indigenous peoples by celebrating a man who set in motion 500 years of brutality against him. And that's what motivates my work with Italians for Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, Pierre, Gazal, and Pablo, would you please um, introduce yourselves and say a little bit about where you're from and your work? Sure. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and we really appreciate the invitation and uh, to be alongside everyone that's here. Um, we're also extremely grateful to uh, Matuin uh, Monroe, who uh, introduced us in the first place and one of the reasons why we're here today. Um, my name is Pierre Belanger. Um, uh, he, him, uh, they, them. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, land of Massachusetts people. I'm reminded of that every day because I live off of Massachusetts Avenue. Um, one of the longest avenues um, in the state. Um, and it's a reminder of the entrenchment of settler colonialism in the very place names. Um, and there's probably no greater form of erasure than the destruction of language. Um, there's physical harm, there's violence, um, gendered violence, uh, but we are reminded, uh, and especially as training as an urban planner, as a landscape architect, uh, who's taught for 20 years at the University of Toronto, uh, Harvard University, um, to be able to understand that at some point also we have to act on these systems and that the world that we're born in as a settler, um, a settler born from um, both English and French sides in Canada, uh, land of uh, Ganyan da -ga, uh, nation, Mohawk people, um, that in many respects, I'm motivated uh, to essentially uh, handing down a world um, that's better than the one that I was born in. I'll just simply mention before handing it off to Gazal and Pablo um, that my family is from the eastern part of Quebec, um, which is a stronghold of white supremacy and erasure, uh, to the point that I interviewed Jean Chrétien, who's the Prime Minister of Canada, and um, whose first job was as um, Indian Affairs Minister and who drafted um, the white paper in 1969. Uh, to be able to understand where the motivations are coming from and what I learned are uh, not so much shocking as much as alarming to hear them still hold true to this day. Um, I'm interested in dismantling those structures, but in order to understand, in order to dismantle them, uh, you have to face them and you have to understand um, how they're made. Um, and 1990s confrontation and the invasion um, uh, at Oka, 
the only second time in Canadian history that the federal government launched the federal army on its own people. That was radicalizing when I was a teenager uh, in a hot summer of 1990, not unlike the hot one that we're experiencing uh, this summer. I'll hand it off to uh, uh, Gazal. Thank you so much for organizing this event and also for inviting us. Um, my name is Ghazal Jafari. Um, I am of uh, Persian and Azari descent. Um, growing up, I heard languages of Turkish and Farsi. Um, I was born and raised in Tehran, Iran, and I migrated here 13 years ago. Um, for education basically and i was trained both in canada and the united states as an architect and urban designer university of toronto and harvard university respectively uh, and before I, I arrived here in charlottesville i lived in boston for five years uh, currently i'm an assistant professor of landscape architecture at the university of virginia and i speak to you today from the lands of the Monacan nation. Um, just to give you a little bit about, uh, a little bit of information about this context, right now um, I'm located in uh, the James River watershed, the same watershed that is also the place of the first plantation colony established in 1607, the first landing of ship carrying people from Africa in 1619 for slavery. Um, I talked to you today from Charlottesville, well, where Heather Heyer was killed by a new Nazi during the Unite the Right rally in August 2017. And from the University of Virginia, uh, a campus that was designed by Thomas Jefferson, built by enslaved people on indigenous land. And um, coming from a background, um, very much affiliated with years of war, oppression, um, economic inequalities, as well as, well as racial inequalities. Um, I always questioned the role and the agency of immigrants um, in racial discourses and discourses related to spatialization of race. Because I have learned over the years that white supremacy works through lines of division, right? Uh, categorizing people into their own brackets and trying to kind of maintain their movements and desires within that bracket. So I think uh, more than ever solidarity between uh, people of color and minoritized communities are really important. Thank you. Thanks Zarin so much for the invitation and I'm really, really happy to share with all of you uh, this moment. Uh, I'm Pablo Escudero. I'm, I'm, I come from Quito, Ecuador, territories of the Quechua uh, peoples. Uh, I come from a family of farmers, but I was trained as an architect, both in Ecuador and later in the United States. I've spent uh, here uh, around six years, also because of my education. Uh, my current work uh, concentrates uh, in the ways in which uh, the public sphere and the public space uh, has been weaponized and racialized through the construction of uh, colonial monuments. In Quito, I've been working with a team of people for the removal of the colonial monument of Isabella Católica. And here uh, I work, uh, here in Boston, I work with uh, OPSIS, uh, and research, archival research related with uh, the Christopher Columbus Park. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Gazal, and thank you, Pierre, for telling us about yourself. Um, so uh, I would like to begin uh, our main discussion. Um, and I think just continuing in the order that we um, started off with, uh, I would like to pose this question to you. Um, how do you see monuments contributing to the public health emergency of racism in your communities? 
And to add to that, what is the work that you're doing um, on these issues, Elizabeth? So um, thanks for that question. And um, first, I want to say in terms of, um, you know, when we talk about confronting colonial myths, I think it's very important to say that the myths of colonization remain with us today. They're not gone. They're not, they're not something of the past. They're something that remain. Um, and to really keep in mind that we're not talking just about something that happened 400 years ago or 500 years ago or 200 years ago. It's something that is with us now and continues to be with us. Um, colonization is not something that happened in the past. Colonization is something that is ongoing. Um, and one of the things that I think that's one of the ways we can think about um, how monuments that really normalize white supremacy actually feed into that, um, that the colonization that continues today. Um, what happens in terms of these monuments that normalize white supremacy, such as the Christopher Columbus monument, the, you know, the, the, the naming of Faneuil Hall, the Founders Monument, um, the Freedmen's Memorial that has recently has been taken down, um, is um, that the perspectives of people of color, our struggles, our values, our contributions are not honored and are not even seen. Um, and it's saying that by having those monuments here, it's saying that we don't find it problematic to honor these things, to honor basically genocide, to honor the stealing of land, to honor oppression, to, to honor um, uh, rape. There's, th these are the things that we actually honor, um, to honor taking people into enslaving people and you know, basically keeping them enslaved and not acknowledging what they have contributed to our society. So I think that one of the things that we have to, to look at is what, how those monuments actually impact us today. And the question is around public health and you know what is the relationship in terms of public health, these monuments in public health. It seems um, on first, first thinking about it that it's a pretty far stretch. Um, but in fact, um, um, one of the things that I want to kind of talk about is that that within the dominant culture, we see so many things as separate. We see public health as separate from um, the what we do in terms of art. We see um, science as you know separate from um, you know culture. We see we we separate things, whereas in indigenous cultures, things are seen as all connected. And since things are seen as all connected, trying to make that relationship between what's happening in the public sphere in terms of public heart or public monuments to what might be happening in public health is very is a very straight line, not a straight line, but it's more like a circle. So, so I mean, it's not like there that there's disconnected. However, um, really, even though that's not necessarily the way the dominant society looks at things. Um, it's very clear in terms of um, public health research that there's a clear relationship between our social environment, including racism and discrimination and health outcomes. And for most people, it's very easy to see that in terms of um, particularly um, psychological outcomes, which are, which are very real in terms of issues of self-esteem, issues of depression, um, issues of, of stress. But the thing is, it's also been, um, it's also very clear that there's a big, big correlation between um, discrimination and it, uh, things that, that, um, that perpetuate racism and white supremacy and our physical health. 
So it's not like, you know, there's, there's, there's this big separation between what's happening in terms of what's in the public sphere and what we're looking at in terms of looking at the monuments and what's happening with us physically and emotionally and mentally, those are all interconnected. And what, it, what it's really saying is, is that we don't matter. We do not matter. Um, our history doesn't matter. Our perspectives don't matter. Our suffering doesn't matter. Nothing about us matters. What, what is important is white supremacy. And so we really, I think we really need to kind of step back and think about what, what, what we are saying to ourselves um, as a society as a whole and, and to the people who um, are not part of the dominant culture about how welcome we are here, how integrated we are here, how we are valued or how we are not valued. And public monuments are an essential part of that. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, um, for the work you're doing to address issues of public health and to, to lift up your people. And I also want to um, acknowledge and thank you for your encouragement um, to me because, because of what you had said, we're, we'll be adding an additional panel next week to focus on uh, perspectives of Massachusetts people. So thank you very much for that. Um, Darlene, I would like to turn it over to you to, for this question of um, how do you see monuments contributing to the public health emergency of racism? And what, what work are you doing around these issues? Thank you. I loved with uh, Elizabeth Solomon, all those points that she touched upon, especially, you know, the public health and how it's supposed to be protecting, you know, our wellness and eliminating illness as far as many people as possible. But when we have these type of monuments, we are ignoring the black indigenous people of color and their wellness and we're eliminating the fact that how you know just like you said the aspect of um keeping them healthy <laughs> when you see uh, these monuments being glorified and um one major thing that keeps popping up in my head is that assimilation is not extermination so even though the just like she touched upon and she said, um, it's like saying we don't exist. It's like saying we're, we're not here. And just because a lot of us have assimilated, it doesn't mean that we're not here. It doesn't mean that we're not indigenous. You know, you see a lot of different people here in Massachusetts uh, with the white skin or the dark skin or the black skin. You don't know, you know, if they're indigenous or not and or you know people of color period so to see these statues it's like are they not seeing that i'm right here that i walk down the street that this is my house or this is my school that my children go to uh is it uh, is it really that obvious that they really don't care about my well-being am i not a part of this community so being here in Massachusetts, exactly on you know the Massachusetts tribal lands, that I, I really feel that it's the history. We're not learning our own history. Even our Black Indigenous people of color, they don't know their own history. Uh, they don't know their own history, and it starts with the school system here in Massachusetts. We need to change the school system to teach the real history of what exactly we have going on here. Not only, you know, in, in terms of the indigenous history, you know, our, why is it only one month in February we're learning about black history? You know, um, Juneteenth happened and I didn't even know what that was and I'm in my forties. So it's really important that 
when you have a conversation with someone who believes that we're trying to cancel culture, I'm not here trying to cancel culture. I'm trying to educate you and see what your values really are. And do you really stand behind this person knowing that they did this, 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 and that. After you know the history, and if you really do stand behind that person for what they really stand for, that's a different story. But it's about the ignorance, um, the ignorance and what the school system continue. Even our teachers are not equipped. Our teachers here are not equipped to, because they don't know the history themselves. I had my my five-year-old in the school system, and I, I spoke with this with Erin, I told her this, on Christopher Columbus Day here in Massachusetts, they said, oh, Monday is a holiday. We have Christopher Columbus Day. We will, don't, don't come to school that day. And right away, my five-year-old son said, Christopher Columbus was a bad man. He kills my grandparents. He chops off the hands of little children. And all the kids, kindergartners start to cry. And they say, we don't want Christopher Columbus to come to my house on Monday. You know, and it really was an eye opener for this teacher who did not even know that my son was Taino or a descendant of the Taino people. She did not even know when he would write words. She says, oh, I think he's having a problem with English. You know, he's writing these words. And I'm looking, I'm like, those are Taino words. <laughs> She's like, oh, I thought those are words he just made up. I'm like, no, those are Taino words. Those are not made up words. Those are words in our indigenous language. And so I think it all falls down to our educators. We need to educate our educators <laughs> to tell them the real history. Is this something that you want to fall behind to the mayor? <laughs> is, this some, is this the type of person that you really would eat dinner with, that you would invite into your home? that you would break bread, that you would do community events with. I don't think so. If you know the real history of what this person has done, whether it be white supremacy, whether it be racism, whether it be genocide, you know, rape, if this is the type of person that you wanna have on your team in your community, in your circle, we have a serious problem. But the first thing that we need to do is educate, educate to let these people know this is who this person is. This is what he's really done. If you want to have a museum and put all this information in a museum, do it. If you want to keep a statue, let's put the real history right next to it. You know, Christopher Columbus Day has got to go. <laughs> um, I really, really, really I'm here to reach out to not only my people in the Caribbean, like I said, Massachusetts is huge here. We, there's so many people here that don't even realize that, you know, when you, as Tainos, they don't know the name Taino. Tainos were the Native Americans that Christopher Columbus encountered. Why don't we know that? Why is there keep saying that we are extinct? No, I'm still here. I'm here. You know, I have a whole family. My children are here. There are so many descendants of the Taino people. We are not extinct. And assimilation is not extermination. And that's huge. Just because I'm not running around in Anagua or my regalia doesn't mean that I'm not native. And there's so many people that speak Taino words that don't even know it. Barbecue is a Taino word. Tobacco is a Taino word. Hurricane is a Taino word. And there's so many more Taino words and there's so many more things that people don't even realize. And this is the, you know, being here in Massachusetts, I would love to learn about the Massachusetts tribe, the Wampanoags, uh, the Nipmucks. This is something that, hello, we are here on their lands. Why are we learning this history in the history books? Why isn't this taught? You know, I have to meet another Northern native for them to tell me their cultural things. It's just, yeah, I'm very passionate about educating. I'm also very passionate about wellness, about keeping our black indigenous people of color, um, teaching them about the human body. Obviously, this is what I do. I'm a, I'm a doctor of chiropractic. I'm into the natural healing, holistic healing. So I'm really big on that. Um, uh, I get upset when I hear that they're saying that the vaccine that hasn't even, you know, 
been tested on animals, skipped animal trials, but the first people they want to vaccinate are our black indigenous people of color because we're most susceptible to the COVID? No, no, <laughs> that's not true. So I'm very passionate in, in the sense of health and I love teaching about culture. Um, I'm, I'm so excited here about learning everybody, uh, you know, their role here, that we're not alone, that we're, we're not extinct, that we are here um, and that we can work together and get things done and change. Thank you so much. I'm grateful to you, um, Darlene. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing um, to preserve and teach Taino culture uh, and to raise community awareness about these issues. Um, I've learned a lot from you. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, and now I would like to um, open it up for Heather Lavelle, um, if you, Heather, could talk about um, how you see monuments contributing to this public health emergency of racism and some of the work that you've been doing on these issues. Thank you. Yes, first I'd like to start by um, saying to our viewers, if you haven't seen the most recent uh, news, the Senate today voted unanimously to, uh, on, voted favorably <laughs> on the state flag bill. And, um, and that's a real test, the unanimous vote is, is really a, a real testament to the importance of the bill and sends a strong message to the House of Representatives that needs to vote on this as well. Um, and as an ally working to promote uh, um, the bills within the Massachusetts Indigenous Legislative Agenda, I've seen firsthand how not only the symbols of white supremacy, like the mascots, the flag, Statue of Columbus, Columbus Day, how those things um, are so harmful, but also how the fight um, for justice is also harmful. It takes an emotional toll and it's really hard to um, see that. And it, it motivates me in my work to hopefully be able to share some of that burden. Um, I've seen, I've been to town meetings where Indigenous Peoples Day ha, is being discussed, and I've seen Indigenous people speak very passionately and very factually about the legacy of harm of Columbus. And then I have witnessed Italian Americans stand right up in front of them and flatly deny that truth and go on to justify or deny genocide, saying things like, you know, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for Columbus. He was a scapegoat, a great admiral. Um, disease killed the natives, not Columbus. Uh, the people he enslaved went with him willingly. Uh, or they were cannibals and savages, and he brought civilization. And I really can't believe my ears. And they, and they believe these things. And I just, to, I witnessed the, that emotional anguish that these uh, friends, my indigenous friends go through in this process and it's heartbreaking. Um, they are made to feel like they don't matter. Um, in some contexts, context, denying genocide is so harmful, it's considered a crime, but not here. Here we um, celebrate brutal colonizers and we make indigenous people feel invisible in their own homeland. So we formed Italians for Indigenous Peoples Day about a year ago, and specifically to support the work of the group Mass uh, Indigenous Peoples Day Massachusetts, which is an indigenous led group that's been working for years to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day in Massachusetts. And we have about 350 members, um, including elected officials like Representative Jack Lewis, and Representative Lindsay Sabadosa and Rep Carmen Gentile, as well as Mayors Joe Curditoni of Somerville and Mark McGovern, who's also Italian American of Cambridge. And we've grown a lot since the murder of George Floyd. And it's really interesting to see how non-native people are also starting to get it in terms of how indigenous people also suffer under um, systemic racism. And we helped to build support for a statewide IPG bill last year by um, building support for that bill within the Italian American community because the Columbus, um, the pro Columbus um, voices are very loud 
And so we wanted to provide an anti-racist counter narrative to that. We also support local Indigenous People's Day campaigns in towns and cities. And we're working to um, help eradicate Columbus statues and place names. And we take all of our, um, our lead from our Indigenous advisors and all of our calls to action are based on input and guidance from them. And so we're mainly working to change the narrative around Columbus Day. We want people to know that Italian Americans are not unified in their support of Columbus, though it, it, um, it's, it might seem that way because the conservative Italian American groups claim to uh, speak for all of us. But this conversation shouldn't be about Italians at all. It's about indigenous people. And it's about, it's about it being time for all of us who are part of that dominant white structure to listen to them and to believe the truths that they are telling us. And it's our collective responsibility to acknowledge those truths and repair the harm that we have caused by venerating Columbus for so long. I mean, it's, it's, after all, Columbus was firmly entrenched in the mythology of our country's founding well before indigenous people, I'm sorry, well before Italian Americans came on the scene. So we also do a lot of work to call in our own Italian American community by educating them about Columbus and stressing the importance of decoupling him from the concept of our pride in our our heritage and our culture, and we explain how the focus on Columbus diminishes the achievements of our ancestors who sacrificed so much for us to be where we are today, and they are deserving of our pride, not Columbus. And we explain that we have a responsibility to use that platform that they have given us to make sure that we are not repeating those same patterns of discrimination that they endured and how this is an, a great opportunity for Italian Americans to model empathy and support indigenous peoples in a process of healing. And lastly, so there's so many, so many arguments, so many reasons why it's not, it's positives for why we should not celebrate Columbus. Um, we talk about our Italian American people's history and how that has been completely overshadowed by our obsession with Columbus. Uh, Italian Americans have a long and proud culture of activism and resistance. And we've led, led the way on fight for labor, um, housing, LGBTQ rights, and so much more. And we see our work with Italians for Indigenous Peoples Day as sort of an extension of that legacy. Thank you, Heather. Um, thanks for your clear thinking and, and moral leadership on these issues, as well as the community work that you've been doing on the ground. Um, and, and thanks for giving us the update too on the good news about the bill. Um, and I definitely am grateful for the advocacy work that you've been doing to help make that a reality. So thank you very much. Um, wonderful. So um, I would like to um, ask Pierre, uh, Gazal, and Pablo, if you would like to share now um, and speak to this question of how you see monuments contributing to this um, public health emergency of racism and talk about some of the work that you're doing on these issues. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Aaron. Um, so, I'm briefly going to just say a few words, and then after that, uh, pass it on to Gazal and Pablo and circle back uh, within the time that we have, just to be mindful for the entire group. Um, first, what we'd like to say, you know, as, as architects, as des urban designers, as planners, um, we're particularly interested in understanding um, how the systems of white supremacy are, are not only built, but they're designed, they're planned. Like, there are people that are actively working on the on their construction. And, um, you know, we've been working on it for a few years on, on a kind of like understanding that the city itself, urban space, has, has really been, um, you know, weaponized as part of this very large system of extraction um, that really opposes 
you know, construction within cities and accumulation of resources at the expense of upstream, very often upstream hinterlands or so-called remote hinterlands. Um, and we're particularly interested in trying to understand how to dismantle that structure and to be able to really expose the inequalities. And one thing that we're committed is, is to try to understand, first of all, how they are built and who's in charge of the, the active perpetuation of those systems. And if, if it lies in very often a settler colonial legal system that exists on paper, a lot of architects and planners and will lump together civil engineers as well. You know, the stamp that they put on drawings is a legal entrenchment each time that adds layers of legal institutionalization of the systems of infrastructure that continue to dispossess. And for us, there's a kind of shared commitment of, as designers, who are we accountable to? Number one. And that not only gets us to a question of whose lands are we working on, understanding that the survey map is the sacrosanct and sacred drawing that you never touch. And it's in fact the survey map, the very drawing in the ground that needs to be changed. Uh, number two is what exactly are designers, planners, and engineers fighting for? Are they and they're educated as part of a client service model. So therefore the neoliberal capitalist model of service delivery is also part of that entrenchment of that system. Um, and, and third is what kind of world do we want to leave behind? Because as architects, planners, and engineers, we, there's an imprint that's left. And so what, where we come at in terms of uh, this, you know, this, this conversation is, uh, you know, a uh, a project that led us to um, understanding and asking a question, how did in fact the Christopher Columbus statue arrive at Columbus Park? And how was that in fact instrumentalized? Because it doesn't come out of nowhere. It doesn't come out of um, sort of, you know, vague ideas. In fact, what we, what, what's interesting is, is in the precision in the way in which Darlene's spoken about how these systems are learned and how the educational system in, chooses to entrench and perpetuate, you know, the settler colonial knowledge. Um, how, you know, Elizabeth has spoken about how it affects health in terms of the environments that are generated. We started to try to understand, well, if we face the history by which this statue and this park was created, what could we learn? And the very first thing that we learned is, and that opened up a kind of cracker, you know, a cracker jack box of a whole bunch of different things that I'll, I'll let um, Pablo and Gazal explain. But the very first thing was in the name. Christopher Columbus Park was not conceived as Columbus Park. In 1979, and this is a kind of crux, uh, in the spring of 1979, there was a, three week period in which the, the park was renamed um, by a very small group of council, city councilors. And that undid 30 years of planning a park that was actually originally called Waterfront Park. And that Waterfront Park was intent on establishing relations with the bay, with the waterfront, with the waters that are there, with the ground that's there, to create this urban multicultural children's playground. It was dedicated in 1976 to Frank S. Christian, uh, you know, who was involved in community development. And what happened in 1979 uh, led to the implementation of the statue. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just leave off the kind of, uh, to, to both Gazal and Pablo to speak about two contexts. Uh, one about a national context of what we call Colombianism, which is this veneration and idolization and skewed distortion of history is the result of a number of different events uh, in the course of, of, of Amer so-called American history, uh, nationalistic and in intent. And then uh, Pablo will speak about the details at the kind of local site level of the park. 
and then we'll circle back within the urban context. So I'll leave it to Gazelle to just say a few words about that. Thank you, Pierre. So um, I want to mention three key points about the geographic national distribution of Christopher Columbus monuments, as well as the timeline of their appearance. Um, the case of Boston uh, waterfront that Pierre and Pablo will discuss further in detail is only one of over 200 cases across the United States. Uh, if mapped, these cases show uh, not only a massive, the massive scale of uh, territory, sort of a territory that they mark, but um, these edifices um, also show a historical persistence of their making, right? So the first point here to focus on um, is the question regarding where, when, and how these monuments are built and which organizations and laws are supporting and protecting them. There is a fantastic report published by the Southern Poverty Law Center titled Whose Heritage? Uh, it was uh, published in 2017 and later revised in 2019. The report maps the symbols and edifices of um, Confederacy across the American South. So looking at this report, we decided to open up a comparable line of investigation for Christopher Columbus monuments at national and uh, continental scale to extend the discourse in relation to the American North that is so far, that so far has proved to be impervious to such discourses. Uh, I would like to use this chance to introduce um, our website, our coming initiative titled the 1492 project, which will be released um, in our website, along with the existing open letter to Mayor Walsh regarding the removal of the Christopher Columbus statue in Boston waterfront. Uh, you, you can find a letter and more information at um, confrontingcolumb.us. And we're also listing information about all Christopher Columbus statues across the United States in a Google Doc that is also linked uh, in a website. The second point uh, I'd like to make here is that these edifices are part of the a much larger set of actions, distinct events, publications and historical falsifications that collectively fabricate the myth of Columbianism. Um, consider, for instance, the 1892 World Columbian Exposition in Chicago, uh, which was also the quadricentennial commemoration of the so-called Columbus Landing in 1492. Um, several books written by Harvard professor Samuel Elliott Morrison, uh, who wrote extensively from 1938 to 1942 about um, Columbus exploits. Um, and you know, it's interesting that historian Howard Zinn in his 1980 book, People's History of the United States, um, has underscored the factual errors uh, that Morrison makes in his stories. Uh, the 1975 National Geographic issue on Columbus that is printed uh, in millions of copies distributed worldwide, and Pierre is showing you the cover, um, the 1992 World Wild events and statues to mark the uh, uh, sesquicentennial of the 1492 landing um, and so on. So the list continues. So one particular organization that is really important to mention here is the Knights of Columbus, which is the world's largest Christian brotherhood and Catholic fraternal uh, service organization. Um, that chose this name also as a rebuke to Protestants in the late 19th century. Um, they are one of the original proponents of Columbus Day since 1934. And so if it wasn't for the funding provided by the Knights of Columbus, um, mobilized by the Friends of Christopher Columbus Committee, or rather one white nationalist, Arthur Stivaletta, uh, this edifice of white supremacy that we're talking about today would not exist. Uh, this takes us to the third point. Um, I would like to share a diagram with you. Can you see it? Yeah. Um, so 
the diagram that I'm sharing with you shows the timeline of Christopher Columbus monuments built over time. More specifically, uh, referring to the number of monuments that appear at any given time. And as you can see, the surges in the number of these built monuments um, are responses in a way to important anti-racist social and political milestones in the history of the United States. Literally, when there is an opening towards a different future, these monuments uh, are used as a weapon against people of color. Thus, the historical and political context um, from which these edifices emerge is really important as part of this research. I hand it to you, Pablo. Thanks, uh, thanks, Gazal. So, I want to pick up something that Elizabeth uh, said before, that is the normalization of white supremacy, which I think that is very important in the work that we do. Uh, because the normalization of white supremacy, what it does basically, it is, it, it is not just in the language how it circulates, but it also it, it relates with uh, the material world in which we live and the uh, spatial aspects that we architects, urban designers, uh, landscape architects uh, study that we concentrate uh, in. And specifically what I've been working here uh, with OPSIS, it is trying to answer uh, the question of uh, how it is that the Christopher Columbus Park, the name of Christopher Columbus Park came to be, how it is that the monument was placed. And both the naming and uh, the placing of uh, the monument, it happened through a series of, of, of processes that need to be uncovered in order to fully understand that they haven't been there always. They haven't been, because when we circulate public space, it seems as if, uh, like for example, in Christopher Columbus Park, it seems that as if they will always be there. And for us, what it is very important, it is to uncover what it is the history and the networks that actually make possible those monuments and those names to happen, that actually make possible to perpetuate uh, the normalization of white supremacy. So in some of the research, because what I do at OPSIS, it is uh, basically archival investigations. So we dig into uh, documents. Some of them are oral reports. Some of them are uh, newspaper articles. Uh, sometimes it is site analysis. That means uh, plans made by architects, plans made by landscape architects that made possible to build uh, th these parks and to make these monuments. Sometimes it, it is official uh, documents. And what we find is that through the research of different the different documents it is that it has taken more or less for the city of boston 30 years to make uh waterfront the waterfront and uh, uh waterfront park with about 60 million dollars of uh, uh city funds and federal funds and in about three months all this work that it has taken, it has taken 30 years, it has been co-opted by a very small uh, number of people in a very small period of time, pretty much from April of 1979 to June uh, of 1979, in order to rename the park uh, into Christopher uh, Columbus and to place a monument, which it seems which it, it, a monument that it, it, we haven't found the records that actually show uh, that it has gone through the correct public process. So basically what is very important for us is to reveal all the networks that actually show the processes through which 
these colonial monuments take place. And that perpetuate a distortion of history and the perpetuation of uh, and the normalization of white supremacy. That are create a series of social inequalities in public space. So that is basically what I work in within uh, OPSIS, uh, which is the investigation of uh, the specific details through which uh, these networks operate, these colonial networks operate. Aaron, um, if I can just add one small thing, just to sort of round this off here, um, there's there's a couple of really important facts that we want to point out is um, the renaming of the park when it happened in 1979 in the spring happened in three weeks with only the approval of uh, seven city councilors. Um, the statue was never approved by the Boston Parks and Recreation nor the Boston Arts Commission. Um, Sarah Hutt, the Boston Arts Commissioner between 1990, uh, 1995 to 2007, opened up a green file that we will hyperlink to the open letter to Mayor Walsh and the link that we'll share with everyone tonight. Um, a green file that was identifying and raising questions as to why public funds were being used after the first beheading in 2002 and 2005 and who had paid for the statue and who actually owned it. And she wasn't able to find that information and wondering why is it that the Italian American community was calling for a monument when there was already five different monuments scattered around the city itself. Louisburg Square on private land from 1849. Another one that's in Revere at St. Anthony Church of Padua. Another one of Boy Columbus at the MFA in Boston. And then of all things, they had Columbus Avenue. What we do is try to also establish questions about the fact that there are no drawings. I wanna be really precise. There exists no records of who paid for the statue except for the word hearsay of what Arthur Stivaletta did as part of the committee of one, which is called the Friends of Christopher Columbus Committee. But let's be really clear. The name that is on the base of this granite statue in Christopher Columbus Park today, the Friends of Christopher Columbus Committee is a committee of one. And that is Arthur Stivaletta. It was a it was a fabrication to lend the appearance of authority. Um, and uh, Norwood Monumental Works, A.J. Norwood, dropped the statue on top of the base that they made because they made tombstones. They dropped it in one afternoon before the inauguration on October 21st, 1979. And then there are minutes of a meeting with the mayor, with uh, Fred Langone and representatives of the Italian American community to confirm that they were going to vote for Mayor Kevin White on the election of November 6th for the mayoral re-election of incumbent Mayor Kevin White. Christopher Columbus Park, the statue and the renaming, those two things are a political prid quo, prid quid pro quo, so that Mayor White, who stood to not be re-elected, got re-elected in exchange for the name of the park, and they got to drop that statue into place. That effort by Arthur Stivaletta was essentially aided and abetted by two people. One inside man, which was Fred Langone, a city councilor, who knew the insides of city council. And number two, Phyllis Donnarumma, who was the editor-in-chief of the Post-Gazette, who essentially could reach out to the Italian-American community elite. I'll just finish off with one context here, is that there is absolutely no way that anybody at that time did not recognize that the renaming of this park and the dropping of the statue in place was like raising a wall between the north end and the south end at the period and the height of desegregation that was federally mandated in the school system of Boston. So to go back precisely to the point that Darlene made, an understanding that there is a level of both miseducation, skewed history, but also uneducation that needs to happen, they erected the statue in this park at the very moment that the federal government had essentially said that Boston had one of the most segregated school systems in the city. So not only was this park and space weaponized, it was racialized towards ends of establishing the domination of the Italian American community, which by then was establishing a kind of front of white supremacy and entrenching it. So we would just simply like to 
end off here with the kind of question. In this letter to the mayor, and also as this advocacy to the Boston Arts Commission, to say that we've been here already 15 to 20 years ago with like legacies of opposition. We'd like to also speak to, um, to Representative Aaron uh, Mikulwitz, who said the following tweet on June 10th. Vandalism to private or public property is a completely wrong way to go about making a case for change, and that holds true on the vandalism that took place overnight at Columbus Park. And what we would like to say, in all due respect, Representative uh, Mikowitz, is that on October 21st, 1979, the dropping of, in an afternoon of a statue illegitimate, illegitimately, without public consent, with private money and private interest for political pre quo pro, we asked you what was vandalism. Because as it stands, that statue, the granite base and the interest of a small private group represents the vandalism, the confrontation to, in fact, the multiculturalism that was essentially built by the city for 30 years. And ultimately, it was entrenching white supremacy. And we would just simply ask one more time, what is the vandalism? Because the way that we see it, it's been in the vandalism has been happening for 41 years with this park. So it's on you. And we warn you, you put this statue back, we will take it down and it will end up in the harbor. We guarantee that. Thank you so much for um, sharing all of the fruits of your research. It's really great to hear about um, the depth of study that has gone into um, the founding of the Christopher Columbus statues across the country and in Boston. And I really appreciate you sharing all of the work that you're doing to the advocacy about this um, at this important time. Thank you very much. Um, so at this point, I would like to kind of open up the discussion a little bit um, to if there's anything people would like to say about what has been said, um, that we can do that. And, um, and kind of more along the lines of um, what is your vision um, for moving forward? So how, how can we collectively address uh, these issues in our public art, and our, our public symbols and monuments um, to address this issue of, of racism um, as a public health emergency. So I'll just open it up for whoever would like to, to speak. Uh, Elizabeth? Yeah, um, I wanted to um, kind of riff on a couple of things. One of them um, in terms of what um, Darlene was saying in terms of the need for education and really basically the need to deconstruct uh, the myths that that our society is built on. Um, we, we're really not going to be able to kind of come to any um, movement, I think, until we really actually stop and think about, okay, what really did happen? What are the myths that we are depending upon that, we're, that our society is kind of built on so that we can actually start from another place. Um, we, you know, the myth of Christopher Columbus, the, the myth of, you know, uh, manifest destiny, the, you know, like all, all the, the myth of, of, you know, the, the, of the peaceful um, settlement of the Northeast. Um, there, 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 there are so many myths that our society is built on that that make it easy for these types of monuments to actually be in place. And unless we deconstruct those myths, it will, it, they will continue to happen. The other thing that I'd like to do and in terms of what, um, you know, Pierre and Ghazal were saying um, about the, the, the idea of like there, there being, first of all, that, that, that monuments like this being in reaction to anti-racist pushes um, and the fact that that monuments are developed 
generally, and I'm, not, and I'm not just talking about Christopher Columbus, like many monuments are developed by a few individuals or a group of individuals who have a particular agenda. Um, and one of the things that I want to kind of say is monuments, regardless of what there are, the monument about Christopher, from, of Christopher Columbus is not about the past. When we put up a monument, it's about the present. So to be really clear when we're thinking about what monuments we're putting up is what are we saying about ourselves? What are we presenting about ourselves? What, are, what do we want the world to see about ourselves? And it's very important to not really get caught up into the idea that, you know, that a monument's about a particular history. It's never about the history. It's always about the present. So kind of to, to kind of make that point. Um, the other thing is that to kind of talk about like what do we want to say about ourselves um in terms of a way to move forward is is there a way that as a culture as a society we and when we're looking at monuments that we put up in the future um is there a way to think about that in a real inclusive and intentional way that that starts to think about how we are presenting ourselves has a has a very has it, as instead of being a small group of people really looking at what what does the society as a whole what does boston want to want the world to know about us what is what's the message that we want people to see now and in the future and the only way we can do that is to do that inclusively as opposed to exclusively. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to talk about was the idea of monuments to individuals. Um, I think, it, and this is sort of coming from a from a from a, a, a an indigenous culture as opposed to the dominant culture the dominant culture tends to, as i said like things are separate also tends to look at tends to elevate individual people no individual does anything completely on their own and so the idea that we are pr pr putting up monuments to individual people automatically excludes those who were around them and did and 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 help them do what they what they what they did so if we are looking at what how we want to be seen now and in the future really thinking about do we does it really make sense to to set up monuments to individual people um when that really obviates what else is happening in the culture and the society um, that that may be important, and that's not to say that individual person did not do something, but that really it, the, by elevating an individual, we aren't really looking at everybody in the society and what that means. So um, <clears throat> I guess I would kind of say that really, really to start thinking about how we deliberate going forward in terms of what our monuments are, what our public art is, what does it mean to the, to the, to the, cult, the society in general, who's included, is everyone included? Is it, is it something that, that really reflects who we want to be, who we say we are? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for all of that. Really appreciate hearing it. Would anyone else like to jump in on this discussion question? How we move forward? Heather? I, I have some thoughts too. I think um, while the while these colonial monuments are damaging in and of themselves, I think their impact is felt all the more because indigenous peoples are so under underrepresented in Boston pub Boston's public art. 
and they just um, there's there is, hasn't been the opportunity to um, to have indigenous art and be able to, that can kind of counterbalance some of those harmful messages that are coming from the settler colonial monuments. And I don't think that's going to change until our cultural and our civic institutions start thinking of values like acknowledgement of indigenous peoples and repair um, as part of their core values. I think all of our cultural and our civic institutions need to be thinking in those terms and investing in that repair through art is one of the modes. Um, and also that these colonial monuments have such a permanence to them. They are cast in bronze. They are sculpted, carved out of granite and marble and the artworks and the ideas behind them are intended to last for hundreds of years. And um, perhaps space needs to be made in our society for to think of indigenous art as well as having that same sort of weight and importance both I ideologically and materially if that makes sense yes thank you i think of how um as you said that our institutions need to acknowledge and work with tribes um, and that is a reality that here is not happening um, in our city. And um, these monuments serve as reminders and focal points for that continued reality. For example, um, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe um, recently facing um, some disestablishment by the, by the administration. So these are, uh, just wanting to repeat um, what Elizabeth had said, these are ongoing, ongoing issues of, of colonial occupation. Would anyone else like to uh, jump in on um, how we can collectively move forward uh, to address these issues in our public space? What's, what are some ideas that you might have uh, for people who are listening and, and watching um, to share? Well, um, I did also want to say thank you so much um, to Belmaye, to everybody for being here with us this evening. Um, thank you to Elizabeth Solomon. Thank you, Darlene Flores. Thank you, Heather Lavelle. Uh, thank you, Pierre, Pablo, and Gazal of Open Systems. Um, I look forward to looking at the work that you're, you've done with the, um, with the letter. Um, and I um, also want to say thank you to the Black Lives Matter movement and to, uh, for, for allowing us to, for putting these issues at the forefront uh, of what we're all thinking about right now, uh, as well as the organizers who have been working on these issues in our communities for many, many years, uh, many of whom have <laughs> joined us today and joined us um, at the pa in the past, uh, at the past panel as well. Um, so also, um, wanted to say for our viewers, uh, please join us next week uh, for the third in the series of Confronting Colonial Myths in Boston's Public Space. And we're gonna hear from members of the Massachusetts tribe um, about how um, these monuments contribute to the public health emergency of racism. We'll be hearing from Jenny Oliver, uh, who is an educator and founder of Modern Connections Dance Collective and a local organizer, Kristen Wyman. Um, so thank you again to everybody. Uh, thanks very much to the um, Boston Arts and Culture Office um, for supporting this. And um, thanks again to, to everyone for joining in. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Erin.